Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero Show. We code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we have to sort of finish up uh, our code from, well, the past couple weeks we've been doing a grid-based ray tracer for our lighting transport and I'm pretty happy about it actually. Um, I really like sort of what we ended up doing with it and uh, I'm really excited about the early termination stuff as well. I think that's going to be super, super cool. So at this point, I think all I really want to do is just kind of finish up the uh, the table generation code. And then today we'll just kind of take a cruise through the code and uh, try to get it flowing properly and, and buttoned up so that next weekend we can start the debugging process. Because we, we've put a lot of code, we did a lot of work, um, and there's going to be, a, there, and it's very delicate, it's performance oriented, it has a lot of sort of stuff in it that's that's nuanced. And so I think there's going to be a lot of debugging that goes along with that because, you know, the more like the more performance performance oriented you are, uh, the more intricate the code typically becomes in terms of how the data flows through it, how it's organized. And it's much easier to make mistakes than when you're just when you don't care about how fast something runs. You just need it to run. Uh, you can usually architect it more towards avoiding bugs. So intricacy usually breeds bugs, at least the kinds of bugs that I have where you have like index mismatches and stuff like that. So I think that we're probably going to have our, you know, our hands full debugging all next weekend would be my guess. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just jump in here. We've got a walk table builder and we haven't finished that. Uh, we sketched out what it would look like and we just need to actually uh, enable it now so that we can use, you know, we can build walk tables and use them. So if we look at what happens with compute walk table, you can see that what you do is you say, we have a particular voxel, here's the size, here's the size of each individual cell of the voxel, and then we have some output table, uh, which is just going to be space we're going to use to store uh, all of this, you know, information. And so when we look at this, what we see is we are going to be taking each individual ray from our ray direction table. And remember, that's the thing that gets built by an external program. And in fact, this compute walk table will move into that external program once we're happy with it, because it's fixed. The walk table doesn't change. Uh, based on the rays that you enter, right? Um, so if you just say, here's our set of rays, you have a fixed set of walk tables that go with them. The walk tables don't update in runtime. So we can just move this over and have the run tables that we generate. Those can all go directly into the system uh, as a pre-generated table, exactly like the rays themselves. So what we want the walk table to do is we want it to go over all of the rays that we have. So all of the sample directions here where we have a ray D, we want to complement that ray D with the proper walk table offset where the walk table offset says, here's where in the walk table you would start to start walking this particular ray direction in the voxel. So what we need here is we need this ray dir count to basically reflect this. So we know that we've got these sample directions and you know here's the, the walk tables here, for example. And so what we want to do is say, well, let's pass this in. Let's say, look, I want you to generate the, the walk table. Um, I want you to, to generate it for uh, sample directions. And I'm going to say how many of those uh, there are because, you know, they're, they're going to be proportional to this. And what you'll notice here is there's not ray bundles. Um, in fact, this part right here is probably wrong. I don't think we probably thought about that. It's actually going to be this because we now trace a single ray at a time. So there's actually going to be however many rays there are per sphere. That's what we're going to have. So if we take a look, um, we're going to want to pass in how many sample directions we have. So we're going to say sample direction count and we're going to pass that in here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pull the ray directions out of there. So when we look through our sample directions, and in fact, this is not really ray dir index. It's more like sample dir index. But yeah, 
it's also a ray index, either one's fine. So then if we take a look at light sample direction, and here's the dir, we can say sample directions plus sample dir index, and we're good. Now, when we pull out this ray D here, it's actually fairly straightforward now, because now that we have the sample direction that we're talking about, it's just the ray D, oops, that comes out of that. I need to turn the caps lock key off of this keyboard. Whoever wants caps lock? The walk table offset is going to be written back into here. So that's actually going to be this walk table offset here. And you can see that it's just gonna be whatever destination we've sort of written so far. We wanna assert that we never overwrite the destination and we do that down here, but otherwise we just stream out where all these steps are. Now we have the T terminate and we're gonna need the T terminate to be something that we actually record along the walk table entry. So you can see here that we've got the walk table entry that we're writing to in here. So when we look back up at this, this is not gonna be a U16 anymore. It's actually gonna be a walk table entry. And when we write to the destination, we're gonna be writing to actual like, you know, individual members of this. So this is not probably gonna look like this anymore. It's gonna look more like this. And we're gonna write two particular things out to it. The first one is gonna be whatever the step is here. Uh, and that step is just whatever the, the delta is in the grid. I don't think it needs to be a 32-bit value, um, but we'll do a safe truncate here. I don't think we have one of these, so we'll see. Um, I'm also not sure, it may actually be... So that, that might actually be fine. You know, we may be able to just say, look, what happens if this is just an S16 to begin with? And then we don't have to think about it. All right. So if we look at that, what we need to do is write both of these members. So we need to write the dgrid value, and then we need to write the t terminate value. Like so. And I think the good thing here, again, is that these dgrid values they don't really depend on anything other than whatever you want the size of the voxel to be. And there's two ways that we could do this. Um, and I'm not sure which way is the better way. Uh, because when we do this stepping, we could store... It's always minus zero, minus one zero or plus one in each direction. So you only need two bits per direction to encode what's going to happen. So if you take a look at what this value is here, it really doesn't have to be an S16. It's really just a U8 that would encode that. And the question is, how do we want it actually encoded? Because when we actually use this information, we probably want the value to have been pre-computed. But when we pre-compute the value, it's dependent on the resolution of the voxel grid. So it would mean that the voxel grid couldn't change over time, which may be bad, right? Now what we could do is we could say, let's just compute it, instead of computing it here, we could actually just compute it at runtime. Because computing this table, we could do one set load, and then we could adjust the voxel. And if we wanted to, we could actually store what the voxel dimension was and create the table uh, a set, like create the table anytime the voxel size changes. And that's somewhat compelling because it seems like that's something you might want to actually make sure that you did properly so that you wouldn't have to have the voxel size be fixed. <clears throat> and so what I'd like to do is say, maybe for now, let's actually go in that direction. So if we take a look at this, um, I might say, let's just pull this out for now and say, okay, the light sampling spheres, those will generate, but the walk table uh, will actually have be dynamic. So I'm gonna move these into the lighting solution and we'll just have the walk table entry come out here. Uh, it still could be a global, but there's really no reason for it to be global because people are always going to be loading it off of the lighting solution pretty much always. They're not gonna ever need it to be global. So I might just go ahead and put it in here. So I'll put in here uh, a walk table entry. 
and we'll say that the light sample walk, uh, the light sampling walk table will go in here. And we'll always be able to know effectively how many of those entries are going to be because we know the maximum for any array. If we just say, look, we know voxel dim x plus voxel dim y plus voxel dim z, that's actually more than you could ever have, uh, I would think. But, you know, let's say the worst possible case, you are able to visit, you know, uh, the x plus the y plus the z of the voxel. I don't think there's any way you could ever visit more than that. But let's say that we were going to just take that, uh, all of that into account, and then we would then say, how many total rays do we have? And we could also add a bit of padding in there uh, just to make sure that if we consider the fact that you could visit two per line as well as you step through it, um, it, it may actually be more sensible to take the max here where we say whatever the maximum of these is. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'd have to think about that, but like, you really wanna know about the diagonal, which yeah, I, I think this is, uh, this is overly conservative, but I think we're just gonna go with it. So I'm gonna call this the max desk count here, and I'm going to get rid of these two. And what I'm gonna do is pass the lighting solution in, uh, and it will just generate on top of this. Uh, it'll generate the sampling table. And I need to know where it's going to put this. Uh, I need a memory arena where you want this table. So when we initially allocate the letting solution, we would allocate this piece of information as well. So these are obviously walk table entry sized, and we know we need max desk count of them. That will produce that number, and then we'll just start filling them in. Now the starting location, for some reason, I don't know why we're not resetting this. It seems like that's something we would need. Uh, oh, I guess it's because we just compute it once and then we use at down here, so that's fine. I think that's all we really need to do. From then on, everyone kind of needs uh, to make sure that they write into that table. So let me just go jump back down here real quick. So this right here, in terms of writing out the, uh, to the destination, uh, we need to make that, that pointer there. So I'm just gonna say, all right, the walk table entry test is whatever we just allocated. And uh, then anytime we're doing here, we have to, pull, anytime we're looking up in that table, we need to grab the solution. Now, when we're actually, uh, what's the problem here? Voxel dim. Ah, a little typo there. That should have been a plus, not a dot. Um, I'm not sure what this is saying. What did we do here? We've got span and we've got step. So it looks like span is just checking for exit. We see if we've gone too far in, in, in that particular direction that we've stepped and then we stop because um, we know we can't go in further than that, right? Um, yeah, so that seems fine, and I think this was supposed to be step, not negate, and we just forgot. I mean, looking at it, that seems, right? Let me just see. So we're going through the dimensions here. 
we're looking to see if the ray direction is positive in that particular dimension. And if it is, uh, you know, we're, we're basically just conditioning these two values into positive or negative. And I guess we're just always treating it as if it was positive, and then we just fake the step to go in the other direction. Like, that's all we're doing. That way we keep it always stepping forwards. And then we're taking the dim step here, which is how much you would step, and we're, we're uh, multiplying that value by the voxel dimension. Why is that? Uh, yeah. This is a safe truncate. Um, because the voxel dim should not be large enough to overflow that. Um, everything else seems pretty good. The span versus the voxel dim here, uh, I guess these just want to be signed because that's what our V2S is, but I think that's it. So that computes the entire walk table. Uh, there may be bugs in it. We haven't looked at it particularly carefully, but you know, um, we should be good to go there. So in here where we actually initialize the lighting, Uh, we should at that point be able to do what we need to do. You can see the, the voxel dim is initialized, uh, or I guess the voxel counts aren't here though. But what we would like to do is we'd like to initialize this table probably any time the voxel dimension changed. And I don't know to what extent we really want to support anything quite that complicated. Um, and I don't feel like we really want to do the the... Like we don't want to generate this every frame because that's another way we could do it is like every frame we'd regenerate the walk tables but that just seems like way too much work so i think what we want to do here is probably something where we just say all right in here where you init the lighting um i think that's really the place where we'd like to allocate and we'd like to make this be fixed so you know maybe you have to like uninitialize and reinitialize your lighting if you want to change the dimensions uh, of your voxel, right? Like you have to, you have to give it a, a, the opportunity to sort of re reinitialize everything. So we know the vox cell dim, right? We know what that is. So all we, the only thing we don't really know is what the dimension is of the, you, you know, of, of the light maps. The sample direction count is easier. That's just baked into here. So we would know at some point what those were um, when we look in here. And presumably we would just use uh, total rays per sphere. Um, but I guess we have to do it for every sphere, don't we? So we kind of need that to be a double loop, right? Because there's some number of these spheres and then there's the total number of rays per sphere. So yeah, I mean, I think what we want to do there is <laughs> it's a little annoying because really there's no reason for this. I mean, we now just have a big set of sample directions and we kind of want the sample directions to line up, we, we previously did line them up properly so that they lined up exactly with the octahedral map. So really, you know, this is kind of legacy structurally. It's, it's, it's structurally old because what we more or less want here is, you know, it's, it's really more like this. And then we have here like a sample direction for each of the octahedrons for each of the octahedral map regions. So in here we would say um, that the sample direction is the octahedral map dimension. So, you know, it would be something like this. This is what we actually have and we also don't really need them to be 
based on spheres quite like that. I mean, we can do it that way, but it's a little bit unnecessary. You know, you could also just do this. Do you know what I mean? So we could say, here's how many octahedrons, different octahedrons we want. Here's how many octahedral map squares there are. And that's how many sample directions you get. That just seems more like what you want. Um, and so I kind of feel like maybe we we'll just switch to this. It just, you know. So that way we could just say, hey, there's a value. This is how many rays there are just in our system. Uh, for casting, that's how many sample directions we're going to have. And when we generate our tables, we're going to generate the tables that way. That also gets us out of this business of generating these two disastrously different tables for no reason, um, which is good. So inside here where we're doing the walk table, I can't believe I'm out of water already. I need a big... So here's the problem. I'm really annoyed by how you cannot get a easy to clean glass bottle that holds a lot of water. Like I need way more water for Handmade Hero than one glass, but I hate drinking out of plastic or metal. It tastes awful to me. So I need like a large plastic bottle that you can clean. There are a lot of large, I'm sorry, a large glass bottle you can clean. There are a lot of large glass bottles you can't clean and they get disgusting. But large bottles that, that you can clean easily are harder to come by, large glass bottles. Anyway, so here's the sample direction table. And we know that, you know, we could even just use a ray count on that. So we can just say, look, you know, it's, it's however big it is, we don't care. Uh, and so really all we're looking at is this value here. And so I want to maybe force, when you initialize the lighting, I maybe want to force you to pass the uh, voxel dim in there so that you can initialize the lighting properly with any information that has to do with, with that, rather than forcing it to wait until it gets a render group to know. So you do that, and it would compute the walk table based on whatever you wanted those dimensions to be. And I think that would be sufficient. In the future, we could allocate this dynamically if we wanted to, and then we could just change it. And you know, I mean, maybe that's the right solution. It's pretty free for us to do that. Maybe I'll just do that. Because if we wanted to do that, it's not hard, right? All we would do is say, like, the lighting solution, you know, has an arena in it arena in it for like the pre-computed data, um, which it like, you know? And so then what we would do is in here, we would just say anytime this stuff changes, we have to recompute. You know what I mean? So if we have uh, whatever the voxel dimensions actually are here, which should in theory come from, yeah. So they come from like here, you know what I mean? So trying to find the value out of there, I don't see that being forthcoming. So it looks like we'd have to do this, right? So the light atlases, they're the things that store the voxel dim, and <clears throat> I don't see anything in particular that, that gets that value out, so I'll just load it. So the specular light, axis, light atlas has the voxel dim here, so that's going to be the the voxel dim that we're looking for. And what I want to do is I want to just remember it. So in here we'd say, 
And this is going to ruin the layout of this thing um, kind of a lot, but, you know, I don't really know what else to do about that. Maybe this way. We'll fix this all. It's just trying to have these things overlaid gets tricky. So in here, I'd just say uh, the table voxel dim. And so when we try to start lighting, we just say like, if these two things aren't equal to each other, then we need to recompute all of our, all of our tables, right? So at that point, we would uh, clear the table memory and we would redo the allocations that were based on it. Does that make sense? So pretty straightforward, um, but that's what we're talking about. So if I look here at where that's actually happening, I go to the walk table. You can actually see uh, in here the voxel dim and the cell dim and that stuff being passed through properly in the sample directions. This will do the allocation with the memory that we give it. And that memory is now going to be coming from the solutions table or uh, table memory, right? We need to pound to find these things reliably for the uh, generation because the generation needs to know them. So in here, we would have what we want our octahedral counts to be. Uh, and, you know, we do want to be able to change these and stuff, but we probably don't want to be able to, we probably can't change them at runtime. I mean, there are ways we could do that, but uh, it's probably a little too difficult for such a performance oriented thing with what we're running up against to really to make that work. Um, can't find where's the, let me see how we're actually, how are we actually uh, calling that though? Let's make light atlas. So you can see here that this is where we actually define this and everything else flows through it, but I don't think that's going to be feasible, like I said, because I think we kind of need to know what that dimension is. So this value here, like this value can be, this value can change, right? But this value really can't. And the reason that it can't is again, because we generate those things as part of an offline process. Maybe at some point we can look at using a different pattern for the lighting that would make it so it's not necessary for us to pre-compute those or so that we can pre-compute them quicker and then we could run it online and change this value on the fly. But for the moment, I think what I'm gonna do is say that this is dependent so we're going to come in here and we're going to say that uh, the octahedral map dim here, and it looks like we only support one of these at the moment. So I'm just going to say that that's symmetric for now, even though I don't know that we actually want that. But let's say that it is. I'm going to call that the octahedral map dim or the lighting octahedral map dim. Uh, and then we're going to use that value here. And that way now we'll know, okay, that value is driven off a single value that's defined when we do our pre-computation and everything else has to obey it. Right? So that's fine. And then we know how many of these we're going to have. We're going to have 64 rays total, um, right? Because it's 8 by 8. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. So we cast 64 rays per, per square. Okay, so I think that's what we want to do. Again, I don't really know. Um, it's, it's kind of nerve wracking to be completely honest with you because if you take a look at the way this scales, it's 64 and right now I think we're doing 32 by 32 by 32 in terms of the sizes of these things. So like if I look at what the renderer, um, oh, no, it's not. 
That's not as bad. That's not as bad. So 24 by 16 by 16. Um, so when you look at the number of rays that we have to cast, it's really pretty terrifying. Um, that's to, op to update each octahedral map with only one new sample. Uh, you have to do that for every frame. So if you take a look at like what speed you might think the processor is running at, um, that's the speed of the processor, you know, give or take. It's, it's not always going to be that high, but something like this. And we have to update it at 60 frames a second. So that means that that's roughly what we're looking at. We can probably count on at least four cores. Um, oops. We can probably count on at least four cores. Uh, so if we then say, well, how many cycles do we have uh, to, to do each of those rays? It's like so tiny, right? Um, it's just really, really bad. Um, so this is why I say like it's, it's really nerve wracking. Um, 508 cycles just isn't very many cycles uh, to work with. Fortunately, like, you know, more cores, it gets better. It scales perfectly with cores. We don't have any intercore dependencies. So that part's reassuring, but it's still scary, right? Um, it's still pretty scary. So we're definitely living on the edge here. I don't love it, um, but, you know, what are you going to do? <clears throat> so anyway, moving along. Uh, let's go ahead and compile this here. So when we look at uh, the sampling octahedron count, the sampling octahedron count, uh, let, me, let me put this in properly here. The sampling octahedron count is just how many of these things we want to have. And we don't really care how many we have. Um, we'll use 16 because that's what we were using before. But that number is not as important. Um, this stuff will fall out the number these things will fall out of the cache every frame anyway so we're not going to really get a win by having a low number of these sampling spheres I don't think and we only use one set of them each frame so I guess we could update the same direction on each one and that would be helpful probably um, I'd have to think about that. That might be a good idea, actually, um, to increase the degree to which we can share the cache. But, you know, hard to say. Or at least each core uses one, something like that. So I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, and then what we'll do is in here, where we're actually loading this stuff out, I'm going to change the way this looks a little bit. So when we take a look at the DirSample uh, index, you know, that's which sampling sphere you're using. And so if we wanted to actually load out the proper directions here, uh, what we want to do is we want to just take the sample direction table and we want to uh, probably break this pound define into two pound defines. So we would have the total uh, direct sample and the, the light sample directions per uh, octahedron. So this is how many, oops, this is how many there are per octahedron, and this is how many there are um, total. So we have the sample directions per octahedron and the total, right? Uh, yeah. So in this case, what we want to do is say we don't want this to ever be uh, like out of bounds. So let me just make sure that that works. So we've got the light sampling octahedron count, the light sampling octahedron mask, and now everything is lined up properly, I think. So we've got the light sampling octahedron count and mask here, and we will pick uh, an octahedron index. Uh, 
We will then uh, pick a sample direction. Oops. Uh, by saying the sample direction table uh, plus whatever the octahedron index is times the stride, right? So we effectively want to say for uh, however many there are per octahedron, we're going to go that far in. From there, we just pull sample dirs out. So we say, all right, for each one of these things that we're going to do, we need to load a direction out of this, but it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, the ray bundle index, I don't think really has to be there. I'm not sure what this is doing. Uh, I think this may be old news. Like, why do we need all this stuff? I mean, yeah, this, this seems like it's not really necessary. So let's just take a look at this real quick because um, this is going to collapse down. So what we probably want to do is say the light sampling direction, well actually I guess we don't even need any of this stuff. We don't need the ray bundle index. We don't need any of that. Um, all we're doing here is saying just do plus plus, or I should say sample dir plus equals two. And here we can just say whatever the sample dir zero is, or the sample dir one is, that's the ray D that we wanted. Uh, and here we can just say sample dir plus zero, sample dir plus one. Right. So I think that's all. And again, a lot of this stuff is cruft, stuff that can be removed actually. Um, so in this case, we're going to have to upsample this. Uh, and that's just because, again, it's the old Raycaster. We're still trying to be able to run that in place to the extent that we can. This actually comes from the solution. And we want to store this here as well um, so that we remember we don't have to update it next time. Right, so we need a way of comparing those values, um, which we don't have yet. We change the name of that to this, right? Oh, wait, no, it's there. So I guess that's undeclared. Um, this is probably not included in the renderer at the moment. Uh, and I'm not sure what to do about that. It depends on where we want this to come from, you know? Um, You know, what that value needs to be is hard to say, how that should flow through the pipeline. Like I said, ideally you would just be able to change it to runtime, but because we need to do so much pre-computation, I'm just not sure that's actually feasible. You know, if we could produce this at runtime, we would, but I'm just not sure we can. At the moment, we actually use an offline optimization process to do it. And it could be that we should just switch to some kind of a like Fibonacci like ring. We, we had tried that a little bit and Yeah, I don't know. So, <coughs> um, I guess what I'd say is I don't mind including the lighting stuff in here. I don't think that's a particularly good decision, but at the same time, I don't think it's actually a problem for us. So we might just do that for now. So handmade sampling spheres would go in here. And I'm gonna put a to-do in there that basically says
because it would be nice to not have to do that. So in R equal, uh, I just need that to be in the math library so that we can compare these things. And I'm just going to make one of those. And in here, we're just going to say, OK, I have a V3S. And since that's not floating point, I can actually just do a direct comparison. I don't need to think about tolerances or any of those sorts of things. So I can just say if x equals x, y and z, off we go. So I think at that point, we're in good shape. Uh, the V3 4Xs are probably not included in the render either. Uh, those are going to go away. So I don't know that we really want to do much about that. But for now, I guess I'll just say uh, we'll just do this. Um, and I can elaborate on this comment a little bit. And the reason that I'm saying that is because, in theory, on more powerful machines, you could get more accurate lighting by taking more dense samples of the octahedron. So maybe it's an 8x8, and then in, on some machines it's a 16x16 16 16 because you have more horsepower and you can take more rays, right? That's all. <clears throat> so I think that's everything. I think the entire pipeline is now running properly, and mostly the problem is... We're just not actually generating this this table when we actually generate uh, the sampling spheres. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think if we went to our uh, light generator, should probably get some more water. I'll be right back.
<laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'm going to recap of the first hour. No, you can't. All right, so let's go ahead and actually make this thing generate uh, the extra piece of information that it's not right now. So we have a couple things. We've got the output sphere INL thing, and it's writing out this part of it, right? And I think we've got the other one. I'm not sure. I guess we just always call that one. Yeah. So what we need to do here is we can leave these in, but we need to add these, right? So we want this stuff to now get written in there and before it wasn't. So I'm going to put them at the top because they're now the new thing we actually care about. And then we're going to get rid of all of these pretty darn soon here. I'm just terrified that this whole thing is going to still be too slow. Uh, and then it's unclear whether we want to stick with it or not. Um, although, <clears throat> you know, there are other things we could do. We'll see. Fingers crossed. So here's us printing out the light sample direction to find, which is what we wanted. Um, definition, I should say. And then here's me uh, outputting the, you know, these additional pieces of information. Uh, I don't know if we actually have these parameterized. It looks like we sort of do. Oops. Again, nothing, nothing interesting happening here. Just literally making this spit out the stuff we already typed in so that when it generates, it'll generate the right thing. All right, so here we've got the you know, the two, the counts, these are, you know, the same things. They're just octahedrons now. So I want this to be printed out the same way. Uh, so that's all good. Um, the ray bundles per sphere is not, that's not really what we want. So that stuff doesn't, doesn't follow through. Yeah. So then what we can do is we can actually make this table here. This can actually just be an equals kind of thing. Um, and we can define it in place. And I can loop over all of the data that we actually produced here. And I can avoid doing the bundling. Now, the problem here is that I I feel like this stuff gets bundled and I really don't want it to. Um, I'm not sure. Looks like we didn't maybe finish this or something. Perturb this. I don't know what it means by perturb this. <laughs> I'm not sure why we would need to perturb it. I mean, what we're doing is we're looking and we're grabbing input directions from the set of directions we have and we're using them. That's what we should be doing. I don't know why perturb this. Wh why? So I, I'm not sure I understand what the point of that is. Um, Oh, so I guess I know why. This is the value that this is what's used um, if we don't actually have one that matches our direction. So I guess I could 
I could see why that would be the case. Uh, So maybe it just means, hey, make a little bit of a random, you know, offset from there. So that seems fair. All right. So looking through this now, if we if we assume that, you know, we've produced all this stuff, the interleave directions call is the thing that we kind of have uh, a problem with. So we don't want our directions interleaved anymore. You can see here, like we had what we wanted, which was this, and we're effectively like screwing it up, right? So we're actually like, we want the original thing we started with, which was the Poisson, in <clears throat> which was the Poisson distribution here. And so I think what we probably want is when we call generate octahedral lighting pattern here, we probably want to save whatever those input directions were. Uh, and we can just extend this system to actually have that property, right? Um, so like if you look at how this works in the sphere store, we could just say like uh, sample dir uh, single, and this could be sample dir multiple, right? And so in here where we actually have the spheres that we're writing out, uh, we could just, you know, put them in there. I also don't know that that's, we actually don't want the spheres to be repetitive like that either. Uh, so in a sense, you know, we could actually just do this. Like you can see, we produce the total set of directions here. And what we would want is just before we interleave them, we just want to return these. So if we take a look at when we do generate octahedral lighting pattern, maybe what I'd do is I'd say like, hey, yeah, give me the raw directions as well. And then in here I can just say, I don't know, Get my head out of the way. Here we go. And that would do what I need. Again, I really want to be able to clean all this up, but I'm just, I can't do it yet. I can't make the code um, do what I want it to because I'm trying to leave the other code pass in temporarily. It will be very good if we can get it to the point where I know that this was the right decision and is good and we can rip them out, that would be very nice, but we are not there yet. So I think now uh, that'll be good enough as a patchwork thing, and let's go ahead and return that. Um, oh, wait a minute, it's this, All right? No, it's, what? What are we passing here? Okay, so it's actually output directions that we want, right? Yeah. Okay. So now if we actually run HH light prof, um, we should be able to get an INL here, this one. Um, oops. I don't know if I, I don't have a revert buffer in this version of the editor, unfortunately. Um, so let me just kill this buffer and we'll reload it. So if I go in here to build uh, and we want to, ooh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. Um, so if I want to take and do uh, a certain number of octahedrons, which in this case we're going to say is 16, we have the ray bundle count, and, and I guess we want to reparameterize this a little bit because now the parameters don't really make much sense uh, the way we're asking for them. 
So really we want, instead of ray bundles per sphere, we want like uh, directions oops, per octahedron and octahedron count. Right, and when we ask for it here, we're gonna say like octahedron count and rays per octahedron. And then we'll just allocate these out. These are just wrong now, and like I said, I really want to change this code, but I'm just very nervous uh, because I haven't proven to myself that it's the right direction, and pun intended. And so I think at that point, <clears throat> it'd be really premature to delete everything. That'd just be a really bad idea, right? Uh, so rays per octahedron here, we're doing sampling direction here. We want this to be... Um, times four for this. And when we do ray bundles per sphere, uh, when we're doing like generating lighting pattern, we now wanna do like rays per octahedron as a thing and octahedron count. And let's just clean up this code at least to that point uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so what I wanna do here is instead of ray bundles per sphere being a thing, um, you know, I guess this is just rays per octahedron. And this will just do uh, the bundling operation, right? And that's fine. Uh, for everybody else, they wanted the total direction count anyway, so this code doesn't have to change. It's just gonna generate directions, which is what it should do. Uh, this is rays per octahedron and octahedron count. Uh, and this just gets rid of the multiply by four. That's all it's gonna do. Uh, and that way we'll do the divide by four in here and that'll do the interleave. So at that point, uh, again, just fixing this a little bit and we'll do another fix pass on it once we know we can rip out the other part. Uh, again, the main difference here is just we don't have to multiply by four. And I think we're mostly there now. Okay. Um, looking a little further in, so this is octahedron count. This is raised per octahedron. Although, why does that say bundle index and then we're doing times four? So this is not really a bundle index, is it? It's it's a ray index. Right? That's what's actually happening. And here we're doing rays per octahedron. Um Yeah, and this just, I guess, loops through and it keeps trying to pick successive things from the octahedron, so that's all fine. Um, this is an octahedron count here and here. The ray bundles per sphere is just the rays per octahedron divided by four. Uh, same thing here. So no biggie there. Uh, 
and that seems fine. Um, this actually could be done slightly differently, but I'm not going to care because that's code I'm going to delete anyway. All right, so if we now run H8 sphere, we get what we wanted, which is an octahedron count and arrays per octahedron, right? Which is going to be 64. Now, I think we could probably go one better and say, just give us what the octahedron dimension is. And so let's just make one more pass through doing that because we can do that too. So in here we could say, look, let's get the octahedron dim uh, out of this and then the octahedron, oops, it's not right. Sorry. And then the raise per octahedron is just gonna be the octahedron dim squared. And we probably wanna change the way this works a little bit, you know, in the future, like I said, but octahedron dim is now what you would be passing in there. And that way we can pass in the values we actually are thinking about. Um, and similarly, this could print out the right value now. So we could say, oh, okay, octahedron dim is the thing I actually know. Uh, maybe that actually goes here. So when we print out the sphere, now we can do the count, the dim, and the rays. Uh, and now it's intuitive because it works the same way as it does, like it's looking at the same thing um, that we would expect to see. So we know if we say 16, eight, we'll get what we expect, right? So where do we want to put this? Well, let's just do a temp.inl for now because uh, I don't really know. Um, and also I suppose we probably need this to be in uh, release mode because we're very uh, computationally intensive for this sort of crappy optimization process it's running. Um, What does Jonathan Blow would like to know your address mean? On his stream, he needs to know my address. Should I send him my address in an email? Um, so now we can take a look at that. Always send to mirrors. All right, I will. I will do that. I. I don't know what you people are talking about, but okay. I mean, I can definitely do that. Uh, I'm not sure why I would need to do that. I thought I thought he already had my address anyway, but maybe that's not true. I, I, could, I mean that could that could be very that could be very false, but All right, uh, I have sent that. And now he has that. So, so that's good. Um, I think this assumes that I know my address which I don't always, yeah. All right, I have sent the address. <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay. Wait, why would you troll me to have me send John my address? That doesn't make any sense. All right, everyone is fired. Anyway, I'm going to look at this and see... Um, that looks like what I want. There's my light sample direction. There's the octahedral map dimension. There's the count and the mask. Um, that all looks good. So I think we're good. We just now need to just spam out all of those directions in a line. Uh, so basically like right here. And we can do that uh, with this as well. Um, we're basically doing the same kind of loop. We're just printing them out uninterleaved. That's the only difference, right? So here we would say <clears throat> uh, index equals zero, durindex index less than total direction count, and dir index. Then we would say raw directions plus dir index. This is our uh, direction. Uh, and then each of these we would just print out. Now we don't have to print them out uh, in spans like that. We can just print out one at a time um, and let them stream out, right? And we can print these this way. So it's a little clear what's going on. And I think that's all we need. The total direction count is just the raised per octahedron times how many octahedrons we have. Uh, and off we go. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are all fired. I never look at the chat. The one time I look at the chat while I'm programming, you guys are saying something that's totally erroneous. Go on to John's stream and explain to him what you've done. That's your penance. You need to go over to Naysayer 88 stream and you need to apologize. Okay, uh, so just letting the optimizer do its little dance here. And now I'm gonna take a look again and see if we got you know what we expected. Um, there you go, right? And the pattern looks, I mean, I'd have to go through and think about whether the pattern looks right, but you know, it should be regular because it should be, uh, octahedral samples always so they should always go in the order that the octahedron goes so there should be a regular pattern of positives and negatives throughout the entire thing it should never change all right so let's try compiling now that we've generated one of these oh uh, i gotta copy it in uh, so i'm going to copy this temp uh, to handmade code uh, light sampling spheres or whatever it's called handmade Oops, handmade sampling spheres, that. Um, and now we can deal with any compile errors that there are. Uh, so it looks like, look, we're missing a semicolon there. Um, other than that, looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and just fix this code so the next time we run it doesn't have that same bug. Uh, and now in theory, we can actually start to debug this thing. And, you know, we don't have a lot of time left in this particular stream, so we're probably not gonna get very far, but we should be able to basically go through the whole thing now in like one quick pass and just clean up any obvious problems that we have, like forgetting to initialize certain things or, you know, whatever else. So uh, I think the first problem that we're gonna have is out in the HH light prof, we're gonna have the problem that memory arena wise, um, we don't have 
uh, an initialized arena here for the lighting solution. So what we're going to have to do here is probably something where we tie them together. So we could do something like this. Uh, because we're going to need the table memory uh, to have been valid outside here where we're actually doing this. Uh, we need to actually make sure we initialize the table memory. And so... <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure how that should look. Um, Because this never calls begin lighting, I think that means that we would have to do it. So inside begin lighting computation, you know, you look at this, we're not doing this call on the outside. So we're pretty much going to have to do this ourselves, right? We have to, we have to make this call. And that's actually fine because what we can do here is we can actually just set this stuff directly. We don't have to use the table memory. Um, we can just pass like the temp arena instead, and that's fine. So that seems like a better solution pretty much all around. Um, I think that's everything we would need to do. <clears throat> so the voxel dim here is just the spec act atlas voxel dim. Uh, and one thing we might want to do is make compute walk table. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wonder if that should use this value and set it here. I don't know. It probably shouldn't. <clears throat> so we'll leave it outside. Okay. So I think that's everything. So let's start taking a look. Um, I guess we can first see what what we crash on would be the first stuff we can fix, uh, and then we can move on from there. So running the light profiler, um, we'll just see where we get. That's just an errant breakpoint um, that was in the way. Uh, so there we go. <clears throat> so this makes sense because I don't think we ever uh, allocate any of these spatial nodes at all. Um, so that's something we would have to allocate based on, uh, yeah, like how how big the voxel was. I'm not sure why we're not uh, doing that in build spatial partition, though. Yeah, like, so these should just be allocated in build spatial partition. And I'm not sure why they're not. So you get an arena with this and you can see like we allocate um, the leaves so what we should be doing is also allocating the grids like that's what should actually be happening right so in here where we do this max grid index and we do this initialization pass like right before that what we should have been doing was actually allocating the nodes that's what actually should have been now, because this is just initializing to zero, we could just use a rep here. And so this particular loop seems kind of useless and we probably don't actually need to do it. So I'm thinking probably what we'll do instead is we'll just do a push array here and we'll push those uh, nodes onto, this, onto uh, that arena and let the arena clear them. So they'll just be cleared by default, right? There's no real reason uh, to worry about it. So I think what we want here is something like that. So now we've got the spatial grid nodes um, and we're good to go, right? So I think that will fix that problem. And then through here, this all still should work roughly the same. So let me run that and see where we go now. Okay, so now we ended up uh, in compute voxel irradiance and we probably wanna be in debug mode here. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. We probably wanna be in debug mode here because I'm trying to like step through this and understand it and debug it. So I don't really want the code to be all optimized at this point. I want something a little bit more straightforward. Okay, 
So if we pull back to grid raycast here, you can see what's going on here. Um, we're trying to do a sample and I'm not sure uh, what exactly is going on here. Um, this looks like the case where we just didn't hit anything, right? We kind of exited out of here. Uh, and I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, what is the grid index is zero? I'm not, so I'm not really sure what's going on here because the initial grid index should not be zero. Um, So one problem that we're going to have here is when we do the grid indexing, we're going to have the problem of needing to offset the grid by the apron, which I don't think we did. So depending on how we want to do that, we're going to have to actually like plan that out. So this is why I say like a lot of bugs come from problems with how you're accessing things, because you oftentimes need to do ridiculous crap in performance oriented code for code for ease of development you would never have two voxels one that has an apron and one that doesn't because you're just asking for lots of bugs with the indexing into that voxel that is why performance oriented code is so difficult is because languages um, just don't provide the right tools for making that simple this is also one of the reasons why I pretty much always ignore new languages. Like people are always like, oh, you know, you should check out Rust, it's so cool. And what you notice is when you look at the literature where people are saying, here's the features we added, they never try to tackle these problems. They don't even seem to know they exist. You know, I don't really have a problem with memory I don't really have a problem with writing to const things. I don't have a problem with leaks. Those just aren't where I spend a lot of my time. Is it nice to have support to make certain things like that easier? Sure, I'm all for making things like that easier. But when you look at what the really hard problems are that I deal with day to day, they just have nothing to do with that. And this is the kind of thing that they do have to deal with. And I just don't get a lot of support from the language on things like that. I don't see language designers sitting around saying, how do we make it really easy to talk about things like two voxels overlaid on top of each other, one with an apron, one with a knot? You know, how do we make that really easy instead of having the programmer to think it through ahead of time and make ex all these extra, you know, <clears throat> data types to maybe try to like know which index you're working with but then of course those don't work because the actual storage format has to be interleaved and it can't be interleaved if you do it that way right new languages especially today seem to have no understanding of the fact that data layout for performance is the thing that languages currently do poorly and new languages if anything are doing them even more poorly Does that make sense? So it's just, <clears throat> it's people not understanding. I think because a lot of people who design languages are just used to dealing with very simple code, I guess. Like they just don't deal with performance oriented code, which maybe is why their compilers are so freaking slow all the time. It's another kind of logical consequence, I suppose. <clears throat> so, Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what we would need to do here to make that indexing be more proper. So if we take a look at what's gonna happen, when we come through here, we're going to be, uh, when, when we're sweeping through uh, the, you know, we're generating work orders, and then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be trying to raycast <clears throat> off of each slice and you can see when we do this in full cast, right, we're expecting this initial grid index to come in. And when we look at what's happening with initial grid index, that's we're just passing it through to the raycast, and that's where it's gonna start. 
So what we want to do here, um, I also don't really know why full cast needs to be here. It can just be welded into the upper routine, but probably because we had debug stuff going on in there. So if I go take a look at where that's being called, you can see that initial grid index is getting called by doing initial grid index here, and we pass the voxel dim and the uh, V3S. Again, that's not correct. So the problem is this really needs to look like this because it has the apron. And this right here is the voxel dim with the apron included. So this is wrong, you know what I mean? Uh, there's, you know, voxel dim with apron is what we actually want. And uh, that's gonna be, you know, uh, the table voxel dim in this case. So we're always like using grid indices that are, you know, based on that special table. And that's how we're looking up these actual things to, to edit. Now, by the same token, we have to make sure that when we do our spatial partition build, the spatial partition itself needs to be aware of this when it's inserting. And so we have to make sure again that we always did that sort of plus one version of the accessor, which it looks like we did remember to do. So probably we're okay. But again, that's really gonna be a thing that we're gonna have to you know, we may want to make some specific helper functions uh, or even wrap the data type in a way that tries to make it so it's very hard to have those indexing errors because those are errors that I think are very likely, like I'm expecting them. <clears throat> and so we may have to do code work here to force that to not be an issue uh, by taking places where we can afford to do um, some protective coding and try to eliminate that source of error. <clears throat> okay. So let's keep going here. Um, just trying to get more of a, a feel for what's happening here. Uh, so I don't want to see that initial code index of zero anymore because we don't really want that to be happening. Um, I also don't know how we're doing this lookup exactly. Uh, what's the sample piece? So what, what are the, what are we actually getting here as our voxel index? So that actually looks fine. So, um, well, I guess the problem is, so in this case, we are looking at the end of the voxel. That should, hmm. So, I guess the problem here is that it seems like what's happened is when we have exited the voxel because of the spatial node terminator, the problem we're getting is that the t terminate value has already been updated. So I guess maybe what we need to do is t terminate needs to be moved here. So it's only updated on valid. Maybe. Um, <clears throat> but that would still do the same thing. So that should have been valid. I guess it just moves it into the incorrect location. So I think maybe just when we build the walk table. Yeah, okay. So the problem that we're gonna have here is is this is actually wrong. I guess <clears throat> so I think what we actually want to do is do this before we update right so we're gonna want to do um, the previous T is what we actually want and furthermore we probably want to go well I don't know let's put it this way 
I'm going to do this before the T update so that we're always stopping inside the cell that we're currently on. Um, and the problem that we're going to have is that this value may still not quite be right for picking that cell. So this is a bit of a gamble and we'll maybe have to think about that a little harder, but um, I think that's what we want. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and, and push forward in this a little bit. Okay. So if I pull out back to here a little bit more, I'm going to just take a look at what uh, what the T terminate value is. It looks like that value is zero. So we never actually got in here yet. Um, So I'm guessing that what happens is if we leave on the on this, right? I guess we never really thought about what we do here. And that's a good question. So if we were to do too much work, we would exit out here. But if we also, so, so the question is, what kind of voxel sample do we want to take when we get to a place where we haven't hit anything? And we just want to kind of make sure that that's not a problem. So I guess what we could do is just set probe piece single to just be where we are. Um, and since we're never gonna use that value, we're probably okay. I, I think we'll, I might just defer looking at this behavior until we get to the quality pass, because that's when we're going to have to s decide how we get exterior lighting in or if we get exterior lighting in. So what I'm going to suggest here is let's just initialize the normal to nothing and the probe location I'm going to say is going to be wherever we started. And let's see if that's a better way to do that. Uh, it looks like we had the exact same problem. So I would have thought that would have fixed it, but I guess it doesn't. Hmm. Okay, so looking at what the uh, coordinates are here. There's the sample P. Here's the voxel index. And so that's weird because that suggests the voxel index is actually for whatever our sample is, is out of bounds. So let's see how we got there. What was the actual origin? So there's the ray origin single. And that's the same. So we should always be able to sample the ray origin. That suggests that our mapping here got screwed up somehow, right? So we've got some kind of a problem with our corner value. Um, because this should not have produced, it should not have been possible to produce such a thing, right? So if we take a look at the sample P, um, value that we're getting, uh, which we know is a should have been valid. And we then look at whatever the hot corner was. You know, those should have been congruent. Um, and it looks like they're not.
although they are. So now I'm even more confused. So that actually looks like that should have produced the correct answer. Oh, so this right here is a subtraction um, for rounding. So in terms of where we're casting from, This may have been buggy before. So if we look at what's happening when we do our looking at where we're going to sample, if we subtract the, why, why would we, because we're doing a floor. So we would never want to subtract the centroid of this thing of a cell because we're flooring the value, right? So like, that's just wrong. I mean, if we subtract the min corner, then everything from zero to one should all be in that corner. And then only when you get to like one point something or at one exactly, do you move to the next one, right? So that just feels wrong and I'm not sure why we did that but that's not good so I feel like that's just an erroneous um, that that should not have been that way that was just a bug that we had and didn't know right I don't know why yeah so that should have been been right so let's see what the values are now So that's correct. Um, I don't understand why we would get an out of bounds error at that point because zero, zero, zero would be a legal voxel. These are supposed to be clamped, right? Um, TX and TY could be wrong and they are. So TX and TY, uh, in this case, the sample normal is probably zero, which we don't support. Yeah. So we probably need to initialize the sample normal to something bogus. Um, and that's fine too. So in here, when we do probe, and s pro probe sample and single, I should be able to just initialize that to like the ray direction or something. And we'll look at, like I said, we do our lighting quality pass. That's when we want to look at what those actually should be. Okay, so this is good because now we're actually running properly and that's what we would like to see. Now, we're probably not actually doing anything correct in terms of actual computations. We're probably totally wrong, you know what I mean? Um, but at least we can get some sense uh, of how it's running. So who knows, right? But let's see. So how bad is the timing would be another question. Because I have no idea. And again, we can't really make too, oh. we can't really make too much of a judgment about that because we haven't adjusted it or even looked at if it's doing the right things at all. But we can see like how bad it is at the, you know, initially. So if we go to handmade data and we go to build HH light prof, uh, sorry, debug. Um, I'm just curious how bad the time is at the outset. So, you know, it's hard to make a judgment call on that yet but that you know is significantly faster it's a full second faster <clears throat> um, so if it turns out that we can make this run relatively correctly that bodes well 
we've got a long way to go before we know. Um, so we really couldn't say yet, but you know, at least we're not totally screwed. So we'll see. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here for today and we'll start on the hard work of debugging all this stuff, uh, next weekend. So, I wish somebody had been keeping track of all of the Insobot quotes. So there's a thing that keeps track of all of my quotes, and there's a thing that keeps track of all of John's quotes, but I don't think there's anything that keeps track of all of Insobot's great quotes, and it keeps coming up with these really great quotes. Can we try the game in the current state? Um, so I don't think we can, I mean, we could, but it almost certainly won't work, right? Like, um, cause we've, we just haven't done enough of finishing work on the current lighting scheme. Um, so it's, I don't think that's going to, to work. Uh, but, but we certainly can try it. Um, I think we're just going to get a black screen. Yeah. Um, because basically like we just, we have not, I mean, w w just to give some perspective, we redid all of this code completely and we have never even tested it. Right. So Since this new pass is to speed up performance, where do you foresee getting speed ups after this pass? So there's a couple of different things, uh, but I guess what I would say is heavily optimizing the current way we're doing it now and making sure we've got that totally correct is the first thing I wanna do. The second thing we can do is now that this pass is able to early terminate, we can actually tune this cost metric quite a bit and probably get a fair bit of speed up just by reducing the lighting propagation time, right? I'm hoping that is what all we really need for 60 frames a second, to be completely honest with you. Um, Given two points, do you think there might be a way to calculate the number of voxel cells of Bresenham like line auger and little touch without walking? Uh, yeah, I bet there is. I'm not super motivated to figure it out because we don't really care. Um, cause I'd rather table drive it anyway, I think, but y you might be able to, yeah. I just ran HH light prof. That's, that's what that is. But we just, we, we've got a lot of work to do to like clean this stuff up. So, you know, it's, we've got another weekend's worth of work before we can run this and like have any idea whether it's going to be better. Right. I'm pretty sure it will be though. Um,
I'm pretty sure this will eventually be better because I think we just have a lot more flexibility here. I mean, we can even do a thing where if we had to, we could get rid of the idea of raycasting the grid at all and instead just have people raycast one a one neighborhood around their square so it would just be like bucket brigade you know the whole way uh so we can this scheme can be tuned down and re, it can re, you know the light will become laggier but the performance will get better whereas the aabb scheme didn't really have that ability very well i mean it sort of could do that but not to the degree this can. Has it ever happened that you put so much work into idea and it turned out not working out? Oh yeah, all the time. So, I mean, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The whole reason I wanted Handmade Hero to work the way that it works, where I have to do everything on the stream, is because this is the actual work of programming. Um, so if you're a good programmer, uh, which admittedly takes a lot of work to get to, certainly, so I'm not suggesting that, it, that you just wake up one day and you're a good programmer or something, but if you're a good programmer, then implementing something that you already know how to do is like a non-issue. You just type it in and it's done, right? And so it's especially annoying the way a lot of times programming is taught as if somehow the hard part was like typing in the thing you already knew how to do, but it never is, right? That's only if you're like a total beginner. The hard work of programming and the part that's actually interesting, I would argue, is figuring out how to do something. And so I wanted most of Handmade Hero to show that that takes a long time, it takes a lot of work, and it's actually the place where programmers add value at the moment. Um, programming where you just already know exactly what something is and there's really no mystery to it, that's just not very hard. Not for an experienced programmer, it isn't. Could we generate all these tests we do for the lighting at box creation? What does that mean? HH LightProf does build the spatial partition, but I just don't think it times it. It, that will never be a slow part, though, because you only have to do that pass one time. It doesn't have the kind of multiplier on it the rays do. Remember, the rays multiplier is 500,000. It's on the order of a million. The number of boxes in a scene is like 10,000, right? It's 100 times less. So... Uh, and sort of a, a related thing to that that I should mention, it's also the case that it's not just the fact that that's never going to be the slow part. It's actually more that we want it to be the slow part. It might be the way to say it. So it's less that I'm unconcerned about it and more that my whole goal is to push more work into the initial prepass, because the more work that happens in the initial prepass, the faster this thing can be, because 
the initial prepass only has to operate on a very small number of objects, whereas the raycasting has to operate on a tremendously large number of objects. So, uh, you know, I haven't even multi-threaded the spatial partition build. I could, but that's how much fat there is in that part of the pipeline. It just does not matter yet. So moving work from the raycaster into the spatial partition build is actually great. If we can figure out how to do that, that gives us a lot more options because like I said, we haven't even multi-threaded that part, we could. So we would much rather it take longer and raycasting take less time because that actually opens up whole new avenues for us that we don't have. So I would love that. I would love it if we could make that part slower by make and make the ray part. I would love it if we could make the ray caster faster by making the spatial partition build slower. That would be fantastic. Unfortunately, other than just the grid, I don't have a lot of ideas about what we could do there. Um, but if I had more, I'd use them. I like the idea, by the way, Sagey in 2005, I like the idea of glass milk bottles. Those like kind of ones with the, like a half gallon bottle maybe. Yeah, so I mentioned before at Rad that I made a tool for detecting indexing errors. Um, I, that's true. So the way that you do it is you actually insert code into your program that wherever you have arrays of things, you mark them. So you actually say like, here's, you know, an array and here's its dimensions and where it is in memory. And then the tool is just a backtrace tool where you can say, okay, when I ask about this entry in some other array, it can backtrace through the other arrays to, and tell you which places that one had referenced. So you can see when your indexing goes wrong because you go, you click on, you know, you would look at one of the voxels and you'd say, okay, this one, and it would show you like the wrong node in the other one. And you'd be like, oh, okay. So this person pulled from the wrong node at some point, right? Because you can always add a piece of code that marks it up where you say like, you know, I don't know how to say this, but like, you can do something like this, right? Where I say, okay, suppose I've got these two voxels, right? And I'm going to do something between them. Well, I can say like, box cell A and box cell B like this. And I just say like these two addresses, like I did, you know, work that went from one to the other. So now it knows like this and it can chase those dependency trains. So it can basically say like, oh, I chased all the addresses and then I reverse computed what the indices of those addresses were. And then I showed them to you in a display. And then you can quickly see when you look at the display, you're like, oh shit. Oh, sorry. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I, I have a mismatch somewhere and I can go find that mismatch now that I know it exists. Whereas up until that time, you can't see it. Right. So.
So in Seijun 2005's defense, by the way, I would point out that glass milk bottles are actually very popular now. So although they went out of fashion, uh, they are coming back because milk tastes a lot better in glass than it does in plastic. So if you go to like the fancier places here, like if you go to a really fancy store instead of like, you know, the local cheap supermarket or whatever, the really high end milks that are like local farm, blah, blah, blah. They're like in a glass bottle now again. It's a, it's a marketing like thing now. So I, I think nowadays, you know, I feel like glass went away, but it came back. Could we look for only the farthest box array would hit and eliminate testing all the boxes in between? I mean, no. Because you're trying to find the closest hit. That's how light transport works, you know? Like, light transports from the closest hit, not the furthest hit. No, no, no hardware vendors contact me about the 13 million line problem. I mean, the whole reason I put it up on the web is because I gave that lecture to Intel specifically. And although like some VP called me at some point about it, they never did anything. I mean, to be completely honest with you, I don't understand. I feel like somebody needs to start taking this stuff seriously because even if you don't care about programming, and you don't care about performance, and you don't care about like education, you don't really have a choice to not care about security in today's world, you know? Like the one thing you absolutely can't do is not care about security. So that stuff is the most important stuff for security too. Keeping these stacks simple is the only way to keep them secure, right? Um, the more code you have, the more vulnerabilities you have, period. There's really no more direct measure for how many vulnerabilities you probably have than how much code you have because every line of code is a new thing a hacker can attack, you know? So, um, all right, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks everyone for joining me for this sort of handmade hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along with the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with the source code so you can play around with it. Um, you could certainly start doing the lighting debugging that I'm gonna do next weekend and that'd be a great thing to practice on because it's a very complex system but it's all laid in now. So you could go through and follow it through and figure out what's wrong with it. That'd be a great thing to do. Um, I'll be back here next weekend. We'll all start doing that. And uh, hope to see you back here then. Until then, have fun programming, everyone. And I'll see you on the internet. Take care, everybody.